This video will explain a new technique to utilize data augmentation in deep learning, AugMax, adversarial composition of random augmentations for robust training. Before diving into the details of the presentation and the paper, here's a quick overview of AugMax in two minutes if you're already familiar with the basics of data augmentation and controllers for data augmentation such as auto augment, rand augment, augmix, and the use of adversarial search techniques such as friendly adversarial training. To begin the AugMax algorithm, you start with an original image or data point X. You sample three different augmented views of this image by sampling from the RAND augment N and M parameters. The N parameter determines how many different augmentations to sample from sequentially. So say N equals two, we apply auto contrast and then shear X. Maybe in the next round we sample translate X and translate Y with the N equals two parameterization of RAND augment. We also have an associated magnitude parameter with respect to each of these augmentations collected in the set N used in RAND augment. So we form these three different RAND augment transformed images and now we're going to pixel wise average them together using the mix up algorithm so for each uh, coordinate in the spatial grids for these pixel images we're going to average out the pixel value to form the new image now the weighting between each of these different images is going to be determined by an adversarial search these w1 w2 and w3s are going to be learned from an adversarial search as well as this m star that weighs in the uh, pixel wise average of the original unaugmented image to form the final instance used for uh, training with the loss function with this, say, bird label if this is a CIFAR 10 image. So the key difference between AugMax and the previous work on AugMix is going to be the use of this adversarial controller rather than sampling from uh, manually defined distributions to weight out the pixel-wise averaging between the different augmented examples. We're also going to be using friendly adversarial training shown on the far right of this diagram. Rather than just trying to produce some adversarial image that maximizes the entropy and the confusion in the model, we're going to try to have it make some kind of confident prediction. So maybe at least it's misclassifying it as a cat when it should be a dog compared to just producing some image that is impossible to understand. And maybe also once you explore these high dimensional spaces is impossible for humans to understand as well. And thus isn't really a useful or a label preserving data augmentation transformation. One other key detail is the use of this dual batch normalization scheme where you split the features to have a dual batch normalization between original features and augmented uh, images, as well as an instance normalization to help normalize the features in these high dimensional intermediate layer feature maps. So this is a quick overview of the schema of AugMax and the algorithm. And then here's a quick overview of the intuition. Standard uh, training with uh, regular RAND augment training will have these disparate clusters where you have a lot of white space in the middle and say when you apply a rotation transformation now suddenly the point is in this unoccupied space and it fails on this out of distribution uh, test. Compared to when you use diversity and it covers more of the distribution, but it doesn't have any points close on the decision boundary. When you use naive adversarial attacking, it's all on this decision boundary and it's very confusing and you sacrifice the diversity and the coverage of the space. So AugMax is mix mixing together the diversity, the coverage of the space with these points on the decision boundary from the adversarial attacking and the adversarial search controller that overall balance the trade-offs between diversity of the augmentations and the data distribution coverage, as well as the hardness of individual examples with respect to the uncertainty on the decision boundary. So now we'll begin the presentation and break down these different components. So if you are a little bit lost on this quick overview, don't worry, this will completely walk through each detail of the AugMax algorithm. We'll start off with an introduction to data augmentation, then describe how it's typically been used to prevent overfitting as you quickly overfit to the train set and then no longer continue improving on the test set. And now how recently data augmentation has been used to achieve robustness and this idea of robustness has been a key theme in ideas like out of distribution generalization and distribution shift then we'll discuss the use of data augmentation controllers going from auto augment population based augmentation and then to rand augment which amongst anything else really simplifies the search space and similar to papers such as hierarchical neural architecture search simplifying these search spaces is just as valuable as designing some new search technique like reinforcement learning differentiable architecture search or say evolutionary search AugMix is the predecessor to AugMax, a technique to sample together, to mix together the RAND augment samplings, and then uh, have this kind of consistency loss as well with the original uh, augmented view, and this uh, framework that builds and leads to AugMax. And then we'll get into the details of AugMax, discussing the friendly adversarial search using the entropy proxy to help guide adversarial search in this L infinity ball of how you can uh, perturb the input data, usually images in the case of what we usually study. And then we'll talk about these normalization layers. NVIDIA researchers have been killing it with these normalization layers like the spade layer that's used for GAL-GAN, where you have these uh, pixel drawings and then you can render photorealistic images, or I'm sure you've seen StyleGAN. And StyleGAN also has the, this adaptive instance normalization, the ADA-IN layer, 
that really uses normalization to uh, facilitate the advances in these deep neural networks. Then we'll look at the experiments and results from this paper, uh, add some of the research context around AugMax and how this fits into things like normalization, data augmentation, robustness, out of distribution generalization, and these kind of ideas, and then some general ideas and takeaways that I had from reading this paper. This video is sponsored by Semi Technologies and the Weaviate Vector Search Engine. I highly recommend checking out this web front end to demonstrate these GraphQL queries for neural vector search as well as symbolic filtering. You can see these different GraphQL queries and you do not have to download this data set or set up the Docker container of anything like that to get started with these data sets and with these GraphQL neural symbolic queries. And pretty soon Wikipedia will be added to these endpoints and we're planning on adding all sorts of different data sets to this web front end interface so you don't have to download these data sets to get started with neural symbolic queries and neural vector search. The link to this demo, as well as a YouTube video I've made on Henry AI Labs explaining several GraphQL queries are in the description of this video. At the end of this video presenting the new AugMax algorithm for utilizing data augmentation, we'll discuss how this data augmentation and semantic invariance can improve vector similarity search and improve the vector distances that are used to do things like concept search with vector search engines and all sorts of things with images and particularly the OpenAI clip algorithm. Returning to our presentation of the new AugMax algorithm for data augmentation, we'll start off with a primer on data augmentation. Data augmentation is a technique to transform original data points X into X prime, such that it shares the original label pair. So from X, Y, we construct X prime Y, or we might have X double prime Y, and so on as we sample many different data augmentations for one original data point. So this is very common in images because it's easy in images to define these label preserving transformations. So for example, as we have this uh, say church image and something like the Google Landmarks Kaggle competition, as we shear it or we apply auto contrast or we increase the brightness or any of these augmentations, we still preserve that semantic class label of church or whatever the label of the image is, whether it's cats versus dogs or uh, different shoe brands for product search and these different applications for image classification. The idea of data augmentation is to use these semantic invariances to m have a bigger data set because deep learning is big data technology. It performs much better when it has larger data. So that's one of the motivations of this mostly is to prevent overfitting. We have this phenomenon where if you don't train with data augmentation, you'll eventually hit this point where the training error continues to de decrease and the test error spikes. And then whereas with data augmentation, we want to achieve something like this where the test error continues to decrease with the training error decreasing. So here are some techniques that have been used in image data augmentation. So for images, we have things like kernel filters where you say slide a Gaussian blur kernel across the image, geometric transformations like rotations, translations, horizontal flipping, shear X, auto contrast, or auto contrast would be a color space transformation. Color space transformations are things like brightness, gamma contrast, and so on. Random erasing is where we say, uh, use the kernel filter to zero out the images, or we have somewhat of a dropout in the input space mixing images, which we're going to see a lot with this AugMax and AugMix, is where we're averaging out the pixels between two different images. And then we have deep learning approaches, adversarial training, where say we're using the adversarial search to add a noise map to the image, or we could use the adversarial controller as sort of a meta learning scheme to guide the sampling of the hyperparameters for each of these data augmentations. We have neural style transfer, as you've seen that really cool thing where you can say take a Van Gogh painting and add it to a picture of your dog, and you can use this to form these kind of data augmentations. And this has been used in these out of distribution test sets like stylized ImageNet to see if, if you randomize the style of images, does that cause a degradation in performance? Then also we have things like generative data augmentation where say you sample from GANs or VAEs or these uh, DDPMs and you add that to the data set. So then we have the meta learning where you try to control how exactly you're using these different augmentations. And we have things like auto augment with the reinforcement learning search. Uh, smart augmentation was more of a uh, sort of a differentiable, all the way differentiable between two sampled images and you completely learn the augmentation. And then neural augmentation, another way of kind of sampling the hyperparameters of neural style transfer. But auto augment has kind of, this was written in 2019 and when this was maybe more so early than it is now. And auto augment has kind of turned into rand augment where it's not really so much about the search algorithm like reinforced learning or evolution. It's about the design of the search space itself. Although data augmentation has found most of its success in image data and particularly in contrastive self-supervised learning, it's also being increasingly used for text data augmentation in natural language processing applications. Here's a recent survey I did looking for these different augmentations. We have things like rule-based augmentations like synonym swap or random insertion or random deletion, graph structured augmentation where you use knowledge graphs to try to find uh, nouns and verbs that you can replace and add into the context. 
mix up augmentation similar to uh, the pixel averaging where you say just average out different token embeddings or you just cut and paste the sentences together from your data set in these text natural language processing data sets feature space augmentation where you first embed the data into the say layer uh, it could be layer six or whatever and then you would average out those uh, matrix vector tensor embeddings whatever it is in the intermediate layer of the neural network then you also have neural augmentation where you sample data from a previous trained uh, neural network you have back translation so say you use a data set you're training on english movie reviews and you translate it to French and back to English to get some diversity in your data set. Style augmentation where, pretty cool idea where you can transfer the style. So say you have a very formal writing and you transfer the writing style to a very casually written article and some of you can stack this with back translation, this kind of idea. And then generative data augmentation where you say you use BERT to mask out the tokens and then give it the signaling of the label that you want it to preserve and then it will fill out the token hopefully preserving the label so these are some ideas for how you can generalize this research and data augmentation from images into text which is hard because this is this discrete data domain whereas it's easy to generalize this to say other continuous domains like audio processing and videos and this kind of thing for most of recent deep learning the core application of data augmentation has been to prevent overfitting we have these highly parameterized models with hundreds of millions of parameters in computer vision and commonly billions of parameters in natural language processing and we want to use data augmentation to prevent overfitting with these large models and then achieve this train test generalization whereas we continue to decrease the training error we also decrease the testing error but increasingly recently data augmentation has been viewed as a technique to solve robustness robustness is the idea that the neural network is going to still make a strong prediction depending on these distribution shifts to the test data so the test data might not be independently and identically distributed to the training set, it could have these different kind of uh, transformations to it that make it different from the training data set. So for example, if it's a self-driving car that's only been trained during the day and now it's being evaluated at night, this kind of idea, but generalizing to all these different scenarios. So this paper, Benchmarking Neural Network Robustness to Common Corruptions and Perturbations, illustrates this idea of having these 15 different uh, augmentations that are used to, to corrupt the original test set for say CIFAR 10 or ImageNet. So what we're talking about later on in the paper as we look at the experiments for AugMax and how they evaluate the AugMax algorithm, they use the robust accuracy, which is the average accuracy across 15 test sets where each of the original CIFAR 10 test sets or ImageNet or Tiny ImageNet are put through, or CIFAR 100, are put through one of these 15 different data augmentations to form the new test set. And as you'll see, applying these transformations to the original CIFAR 10 test set results in a massive decrease in performance. And this has huge applications for say, uh, if you want to deploy this medical image analysis in different hospitals, you could have different lighting conditions in different hospitals, all sorts of different things. There's a paper titled, The Clinician and Dataset Shift for uh, something like this, one of these healthcare machine learning papers that shows how you have many of these distribution shift problems. And this is a huge issue for really solving these problems with deep learning. So keeping in mind that the core motivation we're thinking about is to prevent overfitting and to achieve better robustness by having data augmentation that anticipates this kind of distribution shift in the training distribution, here are some of the algorithms that have been developed to control the use of data augmentation during training. We started off with these complicated search algorithms. Things like auto augment would train a, re a recurrent neural network controller to sample augmentation sequentially and sample the magnitude of each augmentation using the accuracy as a uh, as a reward signal in the reinforcement learning learning framework. We've also seen things like evolutionary search or the ASHA technique to distribute computation and have this random search with unequal uh, computation similar to hyperband and building on that is ASHA. And then we have uh, Bayesian optimization and differentiable search. These kind of ideas of looking at the search algorithm for how we're gonna sample these uh, hyperparameters of data augmentation. But Rand Augment came along and simplified the search space. It said all you need is to sample n and m of these uh, augmentations, n augmentations from a set of capital N augmentations, and then m is the magnitude for these discrete intervals that are specific to each of the augmentations. So Rand Augment came along and simplified the search space and has been a very useful uh, heuristic of utilizing data augmentation in training. So one of the previous state of the arts in achieving robustness was AugMix and AugMax builds on AugMix with the similar naming and the similar kind of uh, algorithm. So AugMix is gonna sample three different Rand Augment 
uh, parameterization. So say this is n equals one, m equals seven, this would be n equals two, m equals five, and this would be n equals three, m equals nine, something like that. So m is the magnitude, n is the number of sequential augmentations to apply to the original image. This is the idea behind Rand Augment. So you end up with three different images. And now what you're gonna weight them together in the mix up and average the pixel value for each of the positions on the RGB image. So, and that's how you produce this X aug image. It's a weighted sampling of these three different augmentations from Rand Augment. So this weighting was determined in AugMix by previously manually defined distribution. So say this is like a heavy tail distribution, this is a normal distribution. These ideas for sampling the weighting parameter from each of these distributions and so on. So compared with this, we're gonna use an adversarial weighting in AugMax, and that's the key difference with this new algorithm in this particular uh, area of it. So then what you did is you also had a weighting with the original image, and this would be the new sample. And one other interesting detail is they used a consistency loss. So you, in addition to having, say, the KL divergence between the prediction on this image and then the one hot encoded class labels for, say, CIFAR 10, where you, say, have a one to indicate it's a deer or a truck or a ship, and then zeros everywhere else, you're also going to have a KL divergence between the logits of the augmented image and the original image, similar to what's used in knowledge distillation with a teacher-student kind of KL divergence. So again, the three different samplings from the RAND augment data augmentation scheme are combined using mixup, where we average out the pixel values between two images. Here's a great example of this in the Keras code examples collection. This is one of the best deep learning coding tutorial uh, collections on the internet. It's amazing and I've been really uh, learning so much from this. I'm really grateful for this. Mixup augmentation for image classification by Sayak Paul. Uh, this is showing you what Mixup does and it's really well illustrated because you see how these, this is the fashion MNIST data set and you see how you have say the sneaker and the jacket or the bag and the uh, pants and this is showing the illustration of what Mixup is doing with averaging out the pixel values for each position. So in the end this is what these AugMix uh, images look like. Compared to say uh, naive Mixup where you're mixing together a bird with a frog similar to fashion MNIST where you mix together this uh, jacket and this sneaker you get these images that are out of distribution compared to AugMix where since you're mixing up these RAND augment, which don't, they don't really completely change the image, you get these smoother kind of uh, uh, augmented images compared to just two different, say different classes or even same class, could be two different birds. They still probably look weird when they're mixed together. So this is a comparison with these other kind of ways of stitching together two different images to form a new image. So now let's go deeper into this idea of the friendly adversarial training for using an adversarial controller to mix together the three images rather than just sampling from a previously defined distribution for the weightings. So this is inspired by the paper, Attacks Which Do Not Kill Training Make Adversarial Learning Stronger. And as a, pre a preface, I haven't completely read this paper, I just skimmed it to get the rough idea of what's going on with friendly adversarial training. So from a high level overview, the idea with adversarial training is we wanna have images that are still like natural images. We don't want the adversarial controller to find this kind of image as static, where see how it has 8.2% confidence. And this is the famous paper explaining and harnessing adversarial examples from Ian Goodfellow and others that kind of led this and showed this problem. And this is one of the examples that's shown to uh, highlight, say the flimsiness of deep learning. And this really hurts the trustworthiness of deep learning systems, this kind of diagram and this kind of vulnerability. But the idea behind adversarial training and adversarial data augmentation is we want to form images where it's where the classifier is saying is this a dog and you say no it's a cat this is just a cat you haven't seen yet and it looks similar to a dog sure but it's a cat so that's the kind of adversarial example you'd want to produce not something like this where the network goes i have no idea what this is and it has a very high entropy prediction it puts equal density on every single class and you go well and neither do i but you know you've been fooled with the adversarial attack so we don't want this kind of image to come out of the sampling we want it to still be a natural image so the way that they try to have a proxy for that is with this entropy so you see how it has 8.2 percent confidence on the static noise compared to 99.3 percent confidence on the panda image that is still a panda we want it to have high confidence so if it's at least making high confidence and it has low entropy on its uh, prediction logits we say that it's a, it's a pretty good heuristic for saying that this is at least probably a natural image compared to something like this. Coming back to AugMax, we have the weighting between the three different samplings from Rand Augment. We're going to have a differentiable adversarial gradient ascent on this weighting, and we're also going to have a differentiable gradient ascent on this weighting of the original image and the uh, averaged out image from this adversarial weighting. And then we're going to try to have one high confident prediction with the friendly adversarial target. And the motivation behind this is if you just do adversarial attacking, you end up with all these points on the decision boundary. Decision boundary meaning, say it has uh, 
you know, confident, high confidence in two different classes. So a point that would be, say, in between the red dots and the blue dots, something like this would have, say, 40% red, 40% blue, 20% green, or something like that. This is the idea of, or it would be more in here, this idea of lying on the decision boundary. So if you just do this uh, projected gradient descent attack, you get all on the decision boundary, and you don't have the diversity of the data distribution, which is the idea of having this coverage in data augmentation, covering all these distributions to achieve out of distribution robustness. And the authors offer a very interesting perspective on how to achieve uh, out of distribution robustness and how these kind of TSNE feature visualization plots illustrate this. So say this is our green, say these are our embeddings for cats and now we rotate a cat and suddenly now it's just slightly in this white space where the classifier has no idea what to do with it as it starts to leave these super separated boundaries. And that's kind of why you'd say maybe a plot that looks like this is gonna be, have really bad robustness compared to something like this which has a smooth coverage and smooth transitions in the feature space. In the appendix of the paper, the authors provide the concrete algorithms for generating the AugMax images and then robust learning with the AugMax algorithm. So I'm not going to completely walk through this, but from a high level overview, this is setting up how you do the gradient ascent for the M weighting between the original image and then the averaged out image, as well as the gradient ascension on the P, which is the weighting within the, um, within the three different. So you have this one is say P and this one is uh, M. And then you uh, put that together, you loop through it, and then you get the new images and you do the training and you have the early stopping. You alternate between the uh, gradient descent steps with the classifier F and then the augmentation function, that's this predefined algorithm. And then you have the gradient ascent isn't really like a function. You don't need to say uh, store parameters for it. You just do the uh, gradient ascent all the way to the input. So you take gradients all the way to the input similar to say these algorithms in feature visualization and things like that. The next massive detail of AugMax is the DUBIN layer shown here. And this is titled Disentangled Normalization for Heterogeneous Features. And normalization is a very powerful technique in deep learning. Normalization is where you say, standardize the distribution of intermediate activations in a layer in the feature maps and the feature activations to be say normally distributed or to control that the parameterization of that distribution based on the data. And that's what ideas like GauGAN, StyleGAN, they really dig into how you can control the normalization parameters and the distributions that you normalize the features to uh, fall into by using the parameters from data. And if you're not convinced of normalization and the power of it, I highly recommend reading this paper, Training Batch Norm and Only Batch Norm from Jonathan Frankel and others. This is showing that you can freeze a neural network and only train the uh, mean and variance parameters that are usually uh, like an exponential moving average from the data. You can just train those parameters and achieve like 83% accuracy on CIFAR 10 or something like that. So th these are ideas, things like adaptive instance normalization. This is how people are achieving faster neural style transfer and other ideas like this. So what they're introducing is the DUBIN layer. And it's common practice in adversarial training to separate the batch normalization statistics from the original data points and the augmented data points. So you have separate batch normalization parameters, the scale and shift parameter, the mean and variance parameter for the original data and the augmented data. And they're gonna, so they're gonna use that in addition to an instance normalization layer. Instance normalization is where you're gonna say, uh, go across the channel access for just an individual feature map. So say you have a convolutional neural network at layer three, you might have uh, for CIFAR 10, a convolutional network layer three, you might have feature maps of the dimensionality height width, 28 by 28, you might have 256 of those. So a 28 by 28 by 256 tensor, and you're going to do an instance normal you're going to normalize those activations because you might not even need the whole data set to normalize this because you already have such a large data object it's already going to benefit from doing the normalization so hopefully that wasn't uh, too much too fast but you have these two different strategies for normalizing the data there's definitely a lot of research uh, opportunities in understanding what's going on with these normalization layers one last time before moving on to the experiments this is the result of vectorizing 300 images from the original cfar 10 data set or tiny image net or image net not sure exactly what data set but you vectorize 300 images and then you use a low dimensional visualization technique like tsne or umap or pca to visualize them on these plots the pgd attack has this l sub infinity thing meaning that you're not constraining the uh the norm which is like the distance to the zero vector for these different uh spaces defined by this subscript and that's how uh, the flexibility of the attack. So again, showing that AugMax is achieving this decision boundary coverage as well as the diversity of these other techniques. Now let's get into the experiments used to communicate the effectiveness of the new AugMax algorithm. Let's start off with the evaluation metrics. So first we're using the robustness accuracy, the average classification accuracy over all 15 corruptions. So these 15 corruptions were shown uh, previously in the presentation in this benchmarking neural network robustness to common corruptions and perturbations. We have these 15 different data augmentations 
and we're going to average the accuracy across test sets where you take the original CIFAR 10 ImageNet tiny ImageNet test set and put them through these different augmentations to form the new test set. And we're going to compare that with the uh, SA standard accuracy, which is just the accuracy on the original CIFAR 10 test set. And this is a great proxy for understanding robustness. So then we might want to kind of sanity check this and have a baseline where we have the uh, where we weight the different errors for the different augmentations based on what errors a baseline model makes. So some of these corruptions might be harder than others to uh, generalized to so say this snow one let's just say that this one causes a serious drop in accuracy say 80 percent to 30 percent well we well, we want to weight that in our uh, averaging based on how the baseline model with trained without any of these special techniques with data augmentation like augmax how that also degrades the snow to just get a better sense of what's happening with this out of distribution generalization and these uh, robust test sets and corruption tests and so on Here's another very interesting detail of their experiments that I personally think will have a huge role in the future of deep learning. They use a train test split with the augmentation. So when we're sampling from, we sample a rand augment augmentation from N and M, and N is the, the number of augmentations to sample from some set of augmentations, capital N. So we're gonna have a train test split similar to train test data set splits, but with the augmentation. So with this N, and this should really be capital N, from this capital N, we're gonna split and have train augmentations and test augmentations. And that's one way of testing this idea of say, few shot learning to new distributions or zero shot distributional generalization. This idea of learning the data distributions that are contained in this original uh, data augmentation parameterization or the data augmentation distribution coverage, and then generalizing to new distributions, such as say these corruption tests. You could say that this uh, motion blur is a new distribution of data that we want to generalize to after only training on the training distribution of, say, zoom blur, contrast, and brightness. Here's a look at some of the results the authors present in the paper. You see the comparison with a ResNet 18 model on standard accuracy to robustness accuracy. A normal ResNet 18 model achieves 95.6% CIFAR 10 accuracy, but when you evaluate it on the corruption test, it drops all the way to 75%. This has huge implications for, say, medical image diagnosis, medical image pro prognosis, self-driving cars, satellite imagery, all these different applications of computer vision. They can't have this kind of vulnerability to these corruptions. We need a way to solve this problem. So luckily, Augmax is on the way to solving this problem. So we go from 96% to 90%, not as sharp of a degradation. And then also with the ResNext, the, a bigger architecture than the ResNet 18, the performance drop is even less than the normal. And also when we use the bigger network, it seems that the normal to uh, corruption test is also even larger. So the next result we're looking at is the CIFAR 100. This CIFAR 100 is basically the same data set, but with 100 class labels compared to 10. So these are the results on ImageNet and ImageNet C, ImageNet C being the uh, RA robustness accuracy set. And then we also have the mean corruption error where we're weighting the uh, corruptions based on how the baseline model. So it's a direct comparison between a normal model trained with say just rand augment and then these particular strategies like augmix and augmax they also introduced the deep augment baseline which i'm not familiar with so i can't say anything about uh, then they also have the tiny image in that data set and then further they look at uh, tiny image net again comparing they also have this ant technique which is another thing from uh, the previous literature that I'm not completely caught up with. Another important detail of this is the overhead training time used in the adversarial search. Augmax only incurs a 1.5x extra cost compared to Augmix with computing this adversarial weighting of the different uh, mixing of the three different Rand Augment images as well as the mixing between the uh, Rand Augment mix and then the original image as shown in the previous diagrams. So uh, this is a comparison with I think another adversarial training technique. I think the difference here is um, as you see it's 37,000 compared to 5,000. I think this is the difference maybe I'm not sure exactly what this is but some kind of other adversarial training scheme that has a much longer overhead as you have to compute these adversarial examples. So here's another uh, ablation of taking apart the DUBIN uh, instance the normalization technique where you have the two channels where one goes to instance normalization and one goes to the dual batch normalization between the original and augmented features and as they mentioned several times in the paper this idea of splitting the batch normalization for the original augmented uh, feature normalization is a very common practice for this kind of uh, augmented training. So another further looking, uh, breaking down these different techniques, these are the baseline methods. And uh, again, with that plot that we looked at for the feature visualization several times, they're trying to break this down based on diversity and hardness and using those kind of uh, diversity and hardness as the way of uh, categorizing these data augmentation schemes where hardness to, refers to these adversarial attacks more so, whereas diversity refers to say, rand augment, auto augment, this kind of like broad coverage of the data distributions. 
The authors further evaluate this on other distribution shifts. And as we saw in a previous paper on the WISE FT technique, where they use all sorts of different, say, domain net or the WILDS benchmark, there are more and more collections of what we mean by these robustness tests and these distribution shift tests and collection data that represents this phenomenon so we can benchmark systems and develop them to overcome the current state of the art. So this is the CIFAR 10.1. I think the key here is there's some different data collection technique. I'm not exactly sure what it is. Maybe the way they internet scrape the images or something like that is different. And then this is the spatial transform attack. It's a, like a different kind of attack that's used to construct the test set. So it's very interesting to think about the other kind of sets we can uh, fine for this kind of added distribution test compared to just using these data augmentations. Maybe we can use things like the Dolly model from OpenAI to generate these kind of new images, all sorts of creative ideas for thinking about how we can form these added distribution sets. And the WILDS benchmark is the thing to look at if you're curious about this. Here's a quick overview of the research context the authors state in their related work. We've discussed many times this idea of robustness to distributional shifts, how we have this distribution shift on the original test data and it's sampled from a different distribution from the training set such that it's not IID, it's a particular kind of distribution shift, and these models fail to generalize to it. This is a, a advancement in data augmentation, how we say do random search through it with the rand augment parameterization of the search space, as well as adversarial search as a search technique compared to say reinforced learning, evolutionary search, Bayesian optimization, these kinds of ideas. And then also this advancement in normalization layers, this DUBIN thing is a huge detail to not overlook. It's a big part of this algorithm and it's a very interesting thing to see how they're using these normalization layers to control the intermediate features of deep neural networks. Another interesting detail of this paper that I don't think maybe was discussed as much as it probably should be was this idea of using a consistency loss between the original image and then the augmented image. So usually you have the KL divergence between the predictions on the RAND augment image and the ground truth label Y. But you might also add a KL divergence between the RAND augment prediction and say another augmentation. You might stop the gradients in the other augmentation. You might normalize this with the entropy to prevent representation collapse. You might sample all sorts of different augmentations and then regularize them with say supervised contrastive learning. You might use L1, L2 distances for the vector similarity compared to KL divergence or I think they use Jensen Shannon divergence. I'm not sure exactly what the difference is with KL divergence, but Regardless, you might do this with the vector space, which is what I'm using with the bars compared to the hats, and then also ideas with the stop gradient. So further, I just think this idea of you can add more structure in the loss function with augmented data. I think this is a promising direction for designing these new data augmentation controllers. As a side note, I was writing these equations using the MathCha editor. This is very useful for writing these kinds of equations and then adding them into, say, Overleaf by just highlighting it and then copying it and pasting it into Overleaf. And then you have these uh, formulas right into your latex papers, and it's way easier than, say, learning how to write equations in latex. Another thing I'd like to talk about more is this DUBIN normalization layer, and the idea of using neural architecture search to try to find things like this. We saw a previous paper titled Evolving Normalization Activation Layers that designed this, uh, that designed this EVO norm uh, S0, B0, these kind of layers of combining normalization and activation, say integrating uh, something like an instance normalization with a ReLU activation, and these kinds of ideas. So. Generally, I just want to kind of ask this question of, do you think neural architecture search, where we have these discrete parameterizations of search space, we use, say, reinforce and learning, evolutionary search, will it be able to design things like AugMax, these kind of high-level algorithms of combining data augmentation in these deep learning training workflows, or normalization layers like DUBIN? And personally, I think that the key step missing from neural architecture search is to add somehow add the natural language processing component, all these advances, to somehow inform it, to somehow let it read the literature and have this kind of intuitive motivation for things like the DUBIN layer. The DUBIN layer isn't a result of these researchers just enumerating the search space and you know throwing darts at the wall. They have this kind of motivation for why it would work to split these different channels and then other people adopt the layer more so because they agree with the kind of reasoning behind why you would want to use it. And I think that's a key thing that neural architecture search is missing. And things like, which is having a discrete search space of these combinations of layers, misses this kind of uh, natural language intuition motivation for why you want to use these different layers. I also wanted to connect this AugMax training scheme with a recent paper summary video on Henry AI Labs, the robust fine tuning of zero shot models paper, the WISE FT weight space ensembling technique. The idea of this paper was to have the zero shot clip model, which achieves better out of distribution accuracy than supervised fine tuning model that start from this checkpoint, this pre-trained checkpoint in this kind of foundation models uh, area of research. And then what they do is they have this uh, weight space ensemble where you average out the weights of the two different neural networks to achieve this model that achieves both in distribution and out of distribution accuracy. Maybe it could be interesting to add AugMax into the fine tuning of these in distribution models and see if that 
improves this kind of ensembling between the zero shot and the in distribution, this kind of idea, maybe Augmax fits into the strategy for fine tuning these models. So finally, I'd like to present how Augmax will impact Weaviate. If you've been following Henry AI Labs, you know that I'm all in on this vector search engine and I'm really excited to be partnering with Weaviate and learning so much from these people building this amazing vector search engine. So the idea of vector search is based on vector distances. Deep neural networks compress high dimensional objects like image pixel grids or videos or audio sequences or long documents of text into vector representations such that you can find semantic nearest neighbors like a similar looking picture of a cat or a similar article that discusses some topic like say neural architecture search or uh, robot taxis or whatever it is. It does this by having this vector distance. So this idea of augmax will improve the ability of vector distance to communicate semantic differences. It will, it will be invariant to these kind of little perturbations like rotations, added brightness, and added rain, and so on, such that this vector distance will become more semantic and more useful for vector search, and these vector search engines will just become more and more useful. So right off the shelf, augmax will improve, say, the clip-based search algorithm. You would add augmax to the pairings between the text and image pairs in this uh, OpenAI's clip internet based data set for aligning text and image so that you can search through image data sets by using text prompts and Augmax will make this an even better technique for searching for relevant images and pretty soon Augmax is generalizable to other data domains as mentioned at the beginning of this presentation looking at text data augmentations it's more of a matter of effort with developing this generalization to other data domains like say graph structure data text data biological data, whatever it is, is more of a matter of effort than is this a possible idea theoretically. Thank you so much for watching this explanation of Augmax, a really exciting breakthrough in the use of data augmentation to balance out the diversity of the distribution coverage with the hardness of adversarial search and finding points that lie on the decision boundaries for these classification problems. Thank you so much for watching and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos. And please check out the Weaviate front end web demo for neurosymbolic queries to also help support the Henry AI Labs YouTube channel.